at the scale of the time, um, you know, and, and Amazon is now able to bring a billion products to hundreds of millions of people in, within a day or two. And you can imagine behind that is a system and data. Um, uh, still, the principles have to yet emerge. But so uh, the second generation to me was kind of, was realizing that a lot of the data was about humans and about preferences. And so they started to go a little bit more towards utilities and economic story and recommendation systems emerged in that era. That's a billion dollar industry, and as was the first generation. Uh, so this was real, uh, and many more companies started to have business models based on data analysis at scale. I think of our third generation now, with all the focus on neural nets and deep learning, as a pattern recognition era. So um, it's all about finding patterns. It's dude and heart on steroids. Um, and the focus has now become things like speech recognition, computer vision, and, and, and uh, forms of natural language translation. Um, and since it looks human-like, people have want to call this... Uh, for better or worse. So I think it's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But pattern recognition is limited. That is not the whole problem of building large-scale planetary systems that uh, deal with data. There's the decision side and there's the market side. How do you put all these decisions together at scale so they don't conflict, they, they, don't, uh, they uh, find coalitions where possible, and they trade off uh, various uh, uh, decision-making um, outcomes? So I'm going to argue there's a huge new set of challenges. Indeed, as Joe alluded to, mathematical challenges emerging now as we put together microeconomics with statistics and, co and computation in new ways. Uh, here's some of the problems I've been working in the last 10 years that have this flavor. I don't want to get into this slide, but just, uh, just to kind of briefly allude to a couple of them. Um, you know, systems that create learning-based markets. So there's three words there, systems and learning and markets that usually are not put together. And I think that's the critical challenge is to put them together in interesting ways. Uh, multiple decisions where statisticians have had a lot to say. Uh, many people outside physics aren't aware of false discovery rate ideas and multiple decision making issues. Uh, they will continue to expand. They're very, very important. And then many others, including things like, you know, real uncertainty, uh, cloud edge interactions, abstractions, provenance. Uh, these are all kind of how do you support your decision making um, how do you make sure that it's not stale data the decision is based on and, and so on and so forth. So there's a blend of computer science and statistics and mathematics throughout this slide. Um, there's not a lot of what's the theory of deep learning here. I do think that's important and the pattern recognition thing is not done, uh, but I think that there's been way too much focus on solely that and not thinking about the other issues that really emerge when you build real world systems. So let's just dig into this for a moment, uh, just with kind of a you know, almost thought experiment. Let's think about you walked into a doctor's office tomorrow and the doctor measured all kinds of things about your body, um, including your genome. And so maybe a 50,000 dimensional feature vector went into some uh, large neural net and the neural net's been trained on all the world's medical data. So the biggest, best neural net ever built. Um, and, and so it's supposed to predict what kind of diseases you're about ready to have. And it's supposed that if one of the outputs is over 0.7, you're being predicted to have liver uh, uh, problems. Um, maybe you should consider a liver transplant. And suppose the number is for you 0.701. You know, is that thresholding a decision? Well, and, and no, uh, you're gonna first of all ask, what's the error bar? And, and error bar itself is a complicated notion. Uh, error bar means uncertainty, but where's the uncertainty coming from? Is it that you used uh, data that's not quite relevant to me? Um, was the data out of date? Was it, you know, was a different machine used? Was a sampling pattern not quite right? All those contribute to a notion of an error bar. And I need to know that if I'm gonna make an actual decision. All right, but it's not only that. When we have real consequences, you're gonna think about counterfactuals. What if I exercised more? Did you know this about my diet? Did you know this about my family history? And so on and so forth. Then it, pretty quickly, you're gonna realize that neural net did not have all the world's knowledge in it. There was lots it missed about me in my moment and in my history and so on, obviously. And so I'm gonna add that now to the story and we're gonna have a little dialogue. And so an actual doctor, would probably rerun an analysis in their head based on the new data. Um, so we have to have a whole system around even just one decision that involves things like provenance, relevance, and, and, and uh, counterfactuals. But it's never just one decision. Think about the medical decisions right now in the COVID uh, uh, episode. Uh, these are linked around the planet. Uh, if you try out a treatment somewhere, that, has, uh, that affects someone else's treatment within a matter of hopefully hours or even minutes. It's been doing, done very ad hoc way right now, but it really is sets of decisions across a network. And of course, it's sets of decisions across a network over time. And this is all done asynchronously. And so we've got to worry about double counting issues. We've got to worry about, again, provenance issues and, and so on and so forth. 
right? But it's even more than that. It's decisions where there is scarcity and competition, all right? If we're talking about decisions in the virtual world, there's really no scarcity and competition. We can copy things as many times as we want, but in the real world, there's always scarcity and competition. So I can't make my decisions alone. I've got to make them uh, aware of the other decision makers and what they're trying to do. And I have to bring in a microeconomic perspective. All right, so here's again a thought experiment that has at least helped me as I started to think about these issues a few years ago. It's just to think about a classical recommendation system. It's just a pattern recognition system. It finds patterns in data and it will sort of do some decision making. It'll rec recommend purchases to you based on similar purchase uh, customers from similar customers. Um, but if you now put in the real world component, you think about the competition. What if I recommend this to a lot of people, which is is certainly what happens at you know Netflix or Amazon. It's not a problem because in the ver everyone, I've got to now worry a little bit more. I got to do print on demand, but still, there's not a lot of scarcity. If I recommend the same restaurant to everyone, I got a problem. Okay, uh, the problem is is that you know too many people will go there, and I have to do some kind of load balancing, and I don't want as an algorithm designer to to figure out how to do that load balancing. I don't really know which restaurant you really want to go to in that moment. In fact, you don't know. Similarly, what street should you go down to get to the airport quickly? Uh, there is a fastest path, but if everyone's taking it, we create congestion. So who do I put on the fastest path and who do I put on the slowest path? I've got to create some notion of an economy here. I got to create a bidding system or some kind of an auctioning system of some kind so that I start to raise economic value and I don't just make ad hoc decisions. All right, now I'm doing this in the microeconomic context but where I don't know the preferences a priori because no one really knows how fast they are in that particular moment until you ask them. All right, so the alternative to this kind of CS uh, machine learning way of thinking of I'm gonna build the world's best system and it knows everything is to create a system that allows people to make decisions on the fly based on evolving preferences and decisions of other, uh, other people. So we wanna create multi-way markets, um, maybe diners on one side of the market or restaurants on the other and they make bids to each other based on recommendation systems of their previous experiences. So they're learning their preferences. I know, I don't know a priori which restaurants I like in Shanghai, but as I start to have experiences, I do like a banded algorithm. I start to prefer certain ones. I want to go there, but Joel also wants to go there and there's a bit of a competition. So we've got to have our banded algorithms or be aware of each other. There's new mathematics that's needed here to think about things like competing banded algorithms in a microeconomic context. All right, so let me just say this one more time. So markets can be viewed as decentralized algorithms. They are algorithms. This is not new to me. People have said this in the past. They accomplish comp complex tasks like bringing the goods in and, in and out of a city every day, uh, uh, all uh, you know, rain or shine for you know thousands of years at different scales and so on and so forth. So they're adaptive, robust, scalable, and so on. These are a lot of the goals of current AI. Um, and people talk about that as if it's just pattern recognition and getting the right data sets. Well, no, it's much more than that. And it's certainly, it should incorporate microeconomic principles. You already get a lot of these things, not for free, but you get them as part of market principles without having the learning system have to do all of them. Now, of course, markets aren't perfect. They have many problems. A lot of those are worked on in economics, uh, but a lot of them haven't emerged yet because we've never really tried large scale learning based markets. Uh, here's some of the things that I'm currently working on, uh, just to give a little flavor, uh, markets in which individual agents have to explore to learn their preferences. We're bringing in uh, bandit style exploration, um, recommendation systems blended with markets, um, and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm gonna get into a couple of examples of this near the end of the talk um, and to give a flavor of where I'm at right now and what kind of things I think are uh, possible and show you some actual theorems. Um, all right, but as I get towards that, I'm gonna now sort of shift gears a little bit and sort of talk about what is gonna be the mathematical interface between machine learning or statistics or whatever you wanna call it and microeconomics, uh, or whatever you wanna call that, okay? So there has been, you know, paths across these things. There's like the, you know, algorithmic game theory links this, these things to some extent with, with not so much learning. Um, there's, you know, hamilton jacobi bellman equations that, you know, sort of encompass all of this at some level. Um, but there's new mathematics needed. And, and so for me, the interface is dynamical systems, optimization, stochastic process, the kind of things that we've gotten really good at in machine learning statistics in the last few years and not that many people are aware of. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our progress there because I think that sets the stage now for new context to be made to microeconomics. 
I should say I'm not a microeconomics person, but I'm learning quickly as, as, as quickly as I can and with books next to my bed. Um, and uh, just one perspective I have currently, and I, I think a lot of economists share this, the future is gonna be all about the dynamics. Um, um, economics is rarely gonna be at equilibrium. Things shift, people learn, uh, things adjust, the world is changing. Uh, so the classical equilibria, Nash, et cetera, and Sackelberg are not gonna actually be the focus here. It's all gonna be about the dynamics as you move around certain sorts of topologies and certain sorts of geometries um, and stochastics. All right, so with that in hand, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the things that have uh, helped condition me, to what, what new things I think we can do in microeconomics because we know some uh, things about geometry and dynamical systems. Um, so um, I'm gonna review a little bit of work from the last few years, uh, trying to tell a story and then get at the end to come at some actual microeconomic examples. Um, so here's a paper I want to highlight uh, with Chi Jen and other colleagues, Praneeth, Rong, and Sham from a few years ago that really helped me. Uh, this is about non-convex optimization. Um, and it's gonna be some mathematics about that, particularly focused on dimension dependence, not just rates, it's actual thinking about the space we live in and the geometry effectively. So let's bring dynamics together with geometry. All right, so you all know what a saddle point looks like. Um, in three dimensions, it looks something like that, but we wanna think about hundreds or uh, thousands or millions of dimensions and the saddle point could be arbitrarily oriented. And if we're a gradient-based algorithm, we'd sort of sniff it out as we move towards it, but we have no idea which are the directions that lead us out of the saddle point and how to find them quickly and so on and so forth. All right, so we might naively expect that these are gonna be really troublesome, that there'll be exponential dependence and dimension as we have to do some kind of a search process to figure out the way out of a saddle point. Now we know empirically that gradient-based methods seem to work in problems, not just neural nets, but other ones where there's lots of saddle points, um, including you know, um, you know, various kinds of uh, mixture uh, kinds of problems. Um, so maybe it's not exponential, but we now need to do the math to figure this out. Um, so just a little bit of background here. Uh, the, it's known that gradient descent asymptotically will avoid saddle points. So in continuous time, this is a fact about gradient flow. It's been known for a long time. It's basically out of Morse theory. Uh, we had a paper doing this with actual gradient descent um, uh, and um, similar kind of result. So you think of that as a positive result in the old days, but nowadays we don't think of that as positive. Asymptotics is too long. Um, and in fact, we know that it can take exponential time to escape saddle points. So even though you'll eventually escape them, um, gradient-based methods can get stuck for a long time. Um, at the same time, we had a positive result already back in 2015 by Gu et al, uh, proving that if you add a bit of stochasticity, you can escape saddle points in polynomial time. Okay, polynomial in the dimensionality. We're starting to get at dimensionality here. All right, but polynomial could be you know, d to the 45th or even d to the third wouldn't be any good when d is hundreds of thousands or millions. So can we prove a stronger theorem? That's what we aimed at. So just to remind you of Yuri Nesterov style uh, theory, um, let's look at uh, convex optimization. Uh, here's, a, here's gradient descent. And as hopefully you all know, uh, this thing will converge in the convex case to a global minimum, but maybe uh, less known very important is the number of iterations to arrive at the global minimum within an epsilon ball is independent of the dimensionality. All right, that's already a striking fact about gradient methods. Um, you can run them in infinite dimensions and they take as many steps as they do in finite dimensions. Really amazing fact about the gradient method. Um, all right, and here's uh, a little mathematical setup. If we're in the Lipschitz case and we want to arrive in with an epsilon of some stationary point, um, if we do that for all epsilon, we get a rate, and there's, uh, you know, uh, an example of a classical rate uh, to arrive uh, within an epsilon ball. It takes you one over epsilon squared iterations. Um, there's a two, there's a Lipschitz constant, and there's the initial distance from the optimum. So this is a beautiful theorem. There's no hidden constants. It's not asymptotic. It's all sitting there. These are natural constants. It's kind of you solve the problem, all right? And you notice that there's no dimension dependence. No D is sitting there at all. So that's a beautiful fact. Now this is convergence to a first order stationary point. Um, gradient is small. Um, what if you run gradient descent on this surface? Uh, well, it'll, it'll move, um, but it could hit a saddle point for an awfully long time. Uh, it could even hit a local maximum and so on. So um, wh what do we know about that? All right, so let's add a little more structure. Let's give ourselves a little more smoothness. Let's have a Hessian that doesn't vary too much. 
And now let's ask not to hit a first order stationary point because that could be a saddle point, that's no good. We wanna hit a second order stationary point, i.e. we want the gradient to be small and we want the minimum eigenvalue the Hessian to be greater than or equal to zero. And again, we get in, we give ourselves a little ball around that and that's parameterized uh, with a strange parameterization, that square root of rho epsilon, just so we don't introduce any new constants in the problem. We got the Lipschitz constant and the same epsilon as before. So we've analyzed in that first paper, at least, um, uh, just a very simple perturbation of gradient descent. We know we need some stochasticity. So we did, did it by adding uniform noise from time to time in a ball around the current iterate. And we did it sporadically and only once every capital T steps where we know how to tell you how to set T, capital T. All right, with that set up, we got a theorem. Um, here it is, the num uh, now in to find a second order stationary point in the non-convex setting, the number of iterations again goes as one over epsilon squared. So no loss relative to gradient descent. That's striking. We can do non-convex optimization with no loss in terms of that rate. But what about dimension dependence? Well, we have the Lipschitz constant, initial distance, it's all looking the same except that little tilde. And that's where we traditionally hide dimension dependence because we can't figure it out. Uh, but we did figure it out, and the dimension dependence is logarithm of d to the fourth power, so polylogarithmic in d. So it's not exponential, it's not polynomial, it's actually all the way down to logarithm. Uh, now, I don't actually believe that four. Uh, that's probably the proof technique, but even after now three years have gone by, we don't know how to get that thing down all the way to logarithm, which I think is what it really is. All right, nonetheless, the point is it's really hardly dependent on dimension, and this really suggests why things, these stochastic forms of gradient descent can work in these non-convex problems. It's one of the ingredients of the explanation, uh, which is that they don't take a large amount of time to find the directions out of the saddle points. Now our proof technique is what I wanted to emphasize here actually. Um, effectively, this is some differential geometry, but it's hard differential geometry in hundreds of thousands of dimensions. So we did probability theory instead, all right? And so here around a saddle point, there's gonna be a region, that green region, where the flow is mostly towards the saddle point. All right, outside the green region, you see the negative eigenvalue and you move out exponentially quickly. All right, so the real question is how thick is that green region? Um, all right, and the way we figured that out, upper bounded it, was by starting by a coupling argument. You start two diffusions a distance little r apart. If they're really close to each other, r is small, both of the diffusions will be in the green region and they will both flow towards the saddle point and they'll, they'll probably couple quickly. At some point, as R gets larger, there'll be a phase transition where one of them is outside the green region and flies apart and they never couple. So you look for a phase transition in the coupling time of, uh, of coupled uh, Brownian motions. Uh, and with that, we're able to get this logarithmic dependence. Um, so that kind of coupling argument we've used again and again and again in a, in a whole raft of other papers after this, the coupling arguments, and it's not just one kind, there's many different kinds, allow you to do geometry differential geometry while avoiding the geometry. Uh, they allow you to capture the geometry with probability theory. And that's been really helpful to get these high dimensional results. All right, once you get a result of that kind where there's no hidden constants and you maybe even nail the dimension dependence and the rate and so on and so forth, you think you're kind of maybe done. And you know you're done when you can match with lower bounds. Um, all right, so the second uh, set of ideas we developed along the way here, which again, I think are gonna be useful going forward are kind of more of a, a uh, constructive way to get um, lower bounds and to get rate matching lower bounds. Um, I do want to point out a paper I forgot to put in the talk, but um, I, uh, is on my uh, website, you'll see a very recent paper with Michael Muhlebach where we have continuous time lower bounds. And um, that's been an open problem of how to find lower bounds in continuous time. Uh, I want to highlight that paper um, uh, on, on, my, uh, on my website with Michael Muhlebach. Um, all right, so uh, lower bounds due to Nimirovsky and Yudin um, allows you to focus on the inessential, get rid of the inessential parts of the problem. And um, uh, actual algorithms that meet lower bounds are often called accelerated algorithms and Nestrov was the leader in developing these. Uh, our perspective on this and not just ours, but a number of others is that it's essential to go to continuous time to understand uh, these matching of upper and lower bounds. Um, in discrete time, where most of optimization theory and computer science for that matter have stayed, when you talk about dynamics, it's not really clear what you mean to accelerate. If you're hopping along a set of points, what does it mean to hop faster? You really need a continuum to, to embed the notion of acceleration in. And if you're gonna ask questions like about what's the fastest you can go, again, being a discrete time, it seems a little hard to even formulate that problem. 
All right. So this was a line of work um, uh, on variational Hamiltonian symplectic perspectives. Again, I'm going to go somewhat quickly. I just want to allude to some of our uh, um, key concepts here. Uh, really going to continuous time into physics kind of concepts was really essential, uh, both to get constructive methods meeting lower bounds and also understand the upper bounds better. So uh, Andre Wibisono and Asia Wilson uh, were key in this. Their work, um, they did their thesis at Berkeley in developing aspects of this. Um, Asia in particular developed uh, the Lyapunov arguments that were critical for us to get a lot of these rates. Uh, and then Mike Betancourt helped us with some of the early symplectic work. Um, so let me go again back to uh, Nesterov and others. Unconstrained convex optimization. Here's waiting descent again. Another way of expressing the rate is that after k steps have gone by, you're within a ball of size one over k of the optimum. Um, at some point, um, somebody, probably Nemirovsky, asked, is this the best you can do? Ask a complexity theory question. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you're now going to talk about a machine to talk about the best you can do. And so Nemirovsky and others thought about a machine that could look at gradients and keep a uh, memory of all previous gradients and uh, make movement in the span of all the gradients you've seen so far. That's an example of a machine. It's not Turing complete, uh, but it's a powerful machine. It can do conjugate grading and so on. In that machine, how fast can you go if you've got an unconstrained convex, op smooth convex optimization problem? Um, and Nemirovsky and others found a lower bound of one over k squared, faster than gradient descent, and it was, uh, to, I think, to people's astonishment that an algorithm existed and was discovered by Nesterov that achieved that rate of 1 over k squared. And it was not just one uh, gradient. It was two uh, steps algorithm. It was a second order dynamical system. Um, the first step was to do a gradient. And the second step was to do a little bit of a rotation, if you will, of the last two gradients. All right, so a very interesting algorithm. But the key was that it was possible to prove that this had the fast rate. Right, so where did this algorithm come from, other than out of the uh, fertile mind of Yuri Nesterov? Um, is there a principle that delivered this algorithm and could deliver other algorithms like this for other manifolds, other geometries, other situations, and so on and so forth? Um, so I think a lot of insight has come in recent years by going to continuous time perspectives on this problem. Uh, so first of all, just remember that gradient descent is the discretization of gradient flow, which is a differential equation widely studied in mathematics. Um, and moreover, gradient flow has a rate. Uh, for convex problems, if f is convex, the rate is 1 over t of smooth convex. Uh, so that corresponds to the 1 over k in discrete time. You can now ask, if we take uh, Nesterov's algorithm, the two pieces, and take the step size to 0, you will get out a differential equation clearly. What differential equation? Uh, and this was done by Wei Ji Su, um, uh, Boyd and Candice. Uh, 2014, and here's the differential equation that pops out from Nesterov. Uh, it's second order, obviously, there were two equations. It has a damping and it has a mysterious three sitting there. Um, and so there you go. So you can't solve this, but you can analyze it with Bessel functions and so on and get some insights into the oscillatory behavior of this equation. Um, so with Andre and Aisha, we looked at this equation and pondered it and asked, is there an underlying principle, some, something like, you know, maybe Lagrange looked at, you know, uh, F equals MA, a differential equation said, what's the underlying principle that delivers that? Why is that a special differential equation? Um, are there any symmetries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So is there a variational point of view on this? In other words, this is a dynamical system which is meant to do optimization. Is there an optimal way to optimize? Is there an optimal differential equation? Okay, that's the, that's the question. All right, so we found, uh, uh, we found a Lagrangian for this class of problems, a optimal way to optimize. And I'm not gonna get into this slide. Again, this is a bit of kind of uh, review, if you will, or just uh, stage setting. Um, but uh, briefly, um, here's our Lagrangian. It's time varying. The alphas, betas, and gammas are not really important. They're different, they're um, sort of degrees of freedom to give us not just one algorithm, but a space of algorithms. They're just diffeomorphisms in time. Uh, the important part is that Bregman divergence, d sub h there, so you need an auxiliary function h, and you measure Bregman divergence between x where you currently are and x plus a time-scaled x dot. So it's a bit of an elasticity in the direction of motion. And you subtract off the potential. So it looks like a Lagrangian. And in fact, if h is quadratic, this reduces to 1 half x dot squared minus f uh, all time scale. So it's literally a classical Lagrangian, but time bearing. What do you do with Lagrangians? You put them inside of calculus of variations. You try to optimize over paths. You get out order Lagrange equations. 
And that leads to, if you hit that with our Lagrangian, you get out the master equation there at the bottom of the slide, uh, which is a second order difference equation, which is appropriate for a range of optimization problems. Um, you can have different geometries in here and a range of different styles of problems given by the alphas, betas, and gammas. Um, if you put in alpha is equal to logarithm of t and you set beta in a, in a corresponding way and h is quadratic, this reduces to the Sue, Boyd, and Candes uh, problem that um, uh, makes a continuous version out of Nesterov. Uh, so it has Nesterov inside of it, but it has a whole range of other accelerated algorithms. And in fact, we were able to get a rate for this equation once and for all. That was uh, H's work. Uh, we have a Lyapunov function that shows you the rate once and for all. The kind of interesting thing is that um, that rate in continuous time can be as fast as you want. Okay, so this is odd. Um, let's suppose I decide I want a rate of one over T and I plug it into this uh, um, Euler-Lagrange equation. What'll happen is I'll get out a differential equation. I can solve it. Um, I, in principle, uh, there will be a path in the phase space I'll follow, maybe that solid path up there, all right? And I'll move along it at a speed, one over T. Now, suppose Joel comes along and says, no, I want to move faster. I know you can move to one over T squared. So I'm going to plug one over T squared in for alpha of T, a logarithm of that. Uh, he'll get out a different differential equation. He will solve it, and it'll turn out he'll move at speed one over T squared, but amazingly, he will move along exactly the same path I move along in this phase space. Okay, hmm, there seems to be some mathematical structure here. And now let's suppose that Ali says, no, I'm gonna come along, I wanna beat these guys, I'm gonna move exponentially fast. So he sets alpha not to logarithm, he just sets it equal to, uh, to T, all right? And he'll get out a different differential equation and he will move along exactly the same path that Joel and I moved on. He'll just zip along at exponential speed. In continuous time, that's actually possible. You can go as fast as you want. So we've lost the phenomenon somehow, but we didn't because we found out that this path is the critical part. The path captures the geometry and allows us to accelerate as quickly as possible. And speed is not important. It's like Einstein said, it's just the clock you're using. It doesn't matter, okay? Ali's just using a different clock, the diffeomorphism on, on ours. That's not important. All right, so we did actually discover something by going to continuous time. We discovered a characterization of the best path to follow, i.e. the geometry, okay? Right now, but when we go back to discrete time, something must break. And in fact, something breaks. Joel and I will be able to take our differential equations and discretize them, all right? We gotta be careful. If we discretize them in stupid ways, we'll lose the fast rate. But I'm gonna tell you there's a way to do that systematically, all right? And we'll get, I'll still have the one over K rate from my one over T. Joe will have one over K squared. He'll recover Nesterov. And Ali will not be able to discretize his differential equation, provably, okay, stably, all right? So there is a phase transition in the ability to discretize certain classes of differential equations. That's actually a good part of what the acceleration phenomenon is about. And you wouldn't have not seen that unless you went into continuous time. The whole phenomenon is sitting there in continuous time. All right, so I view these as mysteries. Why, why can we not discretize when we're using exponentially fast clocks? What happens when we discretize and so on? Um, all right, at some point, I remembered uh, some lectures I had attended back at MIT as a young faculty member on symplectic geometries and symplectic integrators. Uh, these are integrators that think about a vector field in a different way. Uh, so this is due to Hamilton, Jacobi, Poincaré, and others 100 years ago. And they were trying to discretize differential equations, you know, Newton's law, um, you know, Maxwell's equations, and so on. And instead of thinking about, I'm in a space, there's a vector at that space, I follow that vector a little distance, and then I go to the next vector and I chain along. I think about, I'm in a space, and I have a little triple of vectors at a certain point. That defines a little volume element. And as I move along with the dynamics, I flow along, I want that volume element to keep constant volume. It's gonna shear, but have it keep constant volume, right? And if I do that, I'm not only respecting the dynamics, I'm also respecting the laws of physics, conservation of momentum and conservation of other you know, first integrals. So they've figured this out. That's called symplectic integration. It's highly stable because you're kind of keeping volume elements uh, constant. And that means you can take bigger step sizes. And that's actually the connection to acceleration. Symplectic geometry allows you to characterize how big of a step size you can take in these kind of very fast dynamics situations. Um, so here we are symplectically integrating a Bregman. Now we're in the Hamiltonian world instead of Lagrangian. That's just a Legendre transform, no big deal there. And you can see this thing is going down at the kind of desired rate. 
um, the Oracle rate and it's oscillating and it's super stable. If we compare this to Nesterov, this is on a different problem. These are all quadratic problems in high dimensions. Um, uh, it's just as fast as Nesterov, um, but it's actually even faster because if I now turn up the step size for both of these algorithms, everything will shift over to the left, bang, Nesterov goes unstable and the symplectic method is staying stable. All right, so these are good ways to discretize these kinds of differential equations. Uh, they had reasons in classical physics literature, but they also have reasons. They're a good way to think about optimization. All right, so that's a couple of years ago. Um, we had an empirical paper with Mike Betancourt on this. We didn't have a theory of uh, if and only if kind of theory that symplectic integrators keep the fast rates. All right, and I'm going to allude to a, a recent line of work with uh, Guy Franca uh, and, and, and Rene Vidal. I'm going to skip this other part right here. I don't have time for it. Um, uh, this is a paper that we put out about a month ago uh, where there is a theory of symplectic integration for dissipative systems. And there's several slides here I'm going to kind of just hop through. That's for those of you who know about Hamiltonians and symplectic geometry. Um, I think you'll be interested to hear about this connection. Um, and um, uh, the paper exists. So I want to just kind of highlight it here by showing some details, but not getting into the details. Uh, so let me just say what the problem is here. Um, this theory that I alluded to, you know, was developed by Hamilton and others, and they were interested in conservative systems. So systems that oscillate. Um, uh, in optimization, we're not interested in, in conservative systems, really. We're interested in systems that dissipate, that go you know, to an optimum and stop. They don't oscillate, all right? Uh, so somehow there's a mismatch in the goals here. Um, you know, on the other hand, we found this symplectic idea allowed us to move quickly. So you know, we did get something out of it, but it was not quite the perfect match. So what we really need to do is think about how to think about dissipative ideas in the context of symplectic integration. And that's what this paper has done. Again, I'm just gonna skip details here. I don't wanna go through these slides that are available, uh, but we've got a dissipative system now where we have time dependence in the Hamiltonian. And we're gonna ask about discretizations that preserve the stability of dissipative Hamiltonian systems, all right? Uh, so conservative systems are ubiquitous. All we wanna do is put time dependence on our Hamiltonian still have a theory of integration. All right, so we're gonna do this with symplectic geometry together with backward error analysis. So that's a critical part. We want to do a theory here that allows us to do the error analysis because that'll give us these rates. Otherwise, this would be just um, you know, stability results. And here again, it's a slide I won't go through, but just to say, you can pick up Herr et al., uh, you know, vast tomes on backward error analysis for dynamical systems, and they're able to get um, uh, rates uh, you know, by doing you know, interesting forms of backward error analysis on the flow maps of dynamical systems. So again, not going to go through details here, just to say that this theory, very classical in applied mathematics uh, and is ready to be used for people like us. Um, and so you do this, the geometry comes in by talking about symplectic manifolds and all they are are even dimensional manifolds that have these non-degenerate two forms on them. So things like momentum kind of quantities are captured by these two forms. Um, these are symplectic kind of having an anti-symmetry property. Um, okay, so that's very classical. It allows you to kind of put together this beautiful theory that emerged over hundred years of symplectic manifolds to go together with Hamiltonian systems to go together with this particular form of integration. And it all just is a beautiful bundle of ideas. All right, all right, but it's sort of only gonna be uh, relevant to us if we can do this for dissipative systems. All right, so now, first of all, what do you mean to preserve structure in this world? Well, it's Lie derivatives and brackets and so, and so on and so forth. So it's a bunch of different geometry ideas. Uh, and symplectic integrators are just things that have got these nice little invariance properties expressed in this mathematical language. Okay, and so the, you put it all together and you're able to analyze a discrete system in terms of a, of a continuous system and a bounded error. So all the mathematics goes in at the end of the day from a numerical point of view into this equation here due to people like Benetton and Giorgili. All right, what if we go to the dissipative case? All right, well, in some sense, that theory doesn't help you, at least directly, all right? But what you can do is talk about a pre-symplectic manifold, all right? It's a bigger manifold, all right? Um, and um, a picture is gonna kind of summarize it here. We wanna be on this blue manifold, that's the dissipative one, and we're gonna embed this in a bigger lifted manifold, which is gonna be a symplectic manifold, okay? And we're gonna do a particular reduction between these two spaces, which is a form of gauge fixing, getting rid of spurious degrees of freedom in a dynamically sensible way. 
All right. So again, if you know some of these things, this will probably be familiar. Otherwise, hopefully this is just kind of uh, uh, mathematical uh, cartoons for you. Um, okay, so uh, long story short, in this paper, what we do is that we use symplectic ideas on a pre-symplectic manifold uh, in which our uh, overall problem is um, uh, expressed using symplectic ideas. Uh, and that allows us to translate symplectic ideas into um, uh, rates and backward error analysis for dissipative Hamiltonian systems, right? So at the end of the day, there's a theorem which says that you can have a numerical uh, rate as expressed as a continuous rate with a bounded error. Um, all right, and so um, let me, just at the top of this slide, we've now applied this to a class, general class of Hamiltonians, which have or which are time varying, um, and they have a separable form here involving kind of a kinetic energy and a potential energy kind of term, um, as in regular Hamiltonians. And in that paper, we show how to do this for the Bregman Hamiltonian, which I alluded to earlier, the Hamiltonian version of Bregman. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, here's the last slide on this material. You're able to start with one of these general Bregman Hamiltonians and you're able to simplectify and you're able to form, find some numerical maps that you put into your MATLAB or your, to your Python or whatever. Uh, this is a particular string decomposition decomp uh, of maps that gives you a symplectic integrator. And this thing provably has the fast rate in discrete time that you had, the, you had discovered in continuous time. Okay, so that was a bit fast. Um, but anyway, I wanted you to be aware that these ideas uh, exist. And I think it's real progress. I think it really allows us to put together dynamical systems, machine learning, geometry, um, and optimization. All right, so my last, I think, five minutes, um, you know, Joel can confirm that, um, uh, is to now, let's go back to microeconomics perspectives. I think now the open problems have to do with taking these perspectives and bringing them into new classes of problems. So one of the things we're gonna wanna do in microeconomics is talk about moving around spaces that have saddle points in them, because classically that's, those had game theoretic meaning, things like Nash equilibria. Uh, in game theory, we're not trying to avoid the saddle points, we're trying to arrive at the saddle points. They have game theoretic meaning. Um, now we may not completely arrive there, we may just, what we wanted to find the dynamics that moves us towards these things at least. All right, so this has been a subject of a lot of work of can I find Nash equilibria with gradient methods? And uh, it turns out the answers have been mixed, uh, it's harder. Uh, it's it just naive gradient ascent descent will have limit cycles and it will even not even converge. Uh, so with Eric Mazumdar's a student here, um, Eric has led the work on us applying uh, dynamical systems and in particular symplectic ideas to game theory. Um, and again, with one of time, I just want to highlight a couple of points here. This paper exists, you can read. Just a little setup here. We're trying to do a zero sum game in this particular case. Uh, our work is not restricted to that but we have a function f and we have the negative of it from the point of view of the two agents. Uh, we have a gradient and we have a Jacobian. Um, if you do simultaneous gradient ascent, you can converge to limit cycles. And moreover, even more interestingly, you can converge to non-Nashed fixed points. And that's kind of obvious that if you take a saddle point, which is axis parallel, that's a Nash equilibrium. And one direction you're happy if you go up, the other direction you're happy if you go down. If you tilt that saddle point, it's still a saddle point and gradient methods are still happy to find it, but it's not a Nash equilibrium anymore because neither agent is happy. And just topologically, if you have a bunch of Nash equilibria around your space, you're gonna have a bunch of tilted saddle points too. And uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, gradient algorithms find and they're spurious, they're a problem. All right, so long story short, if you run even some of the more sophisticated algorithms that avoid limit cycles, they will unfortunately hit these non-Nash equilibria. So here's a bunch of different algorithms that have been proposed recently. The blue um, star in the middle there is a non-Nash equilibrium. It's a saddle point, which is tilted. These algorithms also hit the green crosses. Those are Nash equilibria, that's good. But they unfortunately hit the blue uh, star, which is a tilted saddle point. All we did is we took the symplectic component of this gradient field, right? And we, instead of highlighting it, it was like we did in the accelerated algorithms, we removed it. The symplectic component turns out to be the component which is responsible for the oscillations. If you remove it, you provably get rid of the oscillations. Moreover, you provably get rid of these non-Nash equilibria. So over on the right there, you'll see this algorithm, the little red dashed line, it heads towards the non-Nash equilibrium, the tilted saddle point, 
but it sniffs out when it's in the neighborhood that it's no good and it moves away from it and hits a Nash equilibrium. So that's pretty interesting dynamics. Um, and there's a lot to explore here about things like rates and, and so on and so forth. I just wanted to highlight that symplectic geometry was being used now in a surprising way uh, in, in the game theoretic setting. All right, and last, uh, and but not least, um, so that was um, a kind of a long dash through dynamical systems and all leading up to some game theory. Um, this last little project I wanna mention is kind of more reflecting where I hope to go in the future. Um, so we're, as I alluded to earlier, I want to do things like bring banded algorithms where we have exploration, exploitation, and rates, and so on, regrets, in contact with things like matching markets from microeconomics, a form of you know, game theory. So this is work with uh, Lydia uh, Liu and Horia Mania here at Berkeley, students in my group. Um, and just briefly, um, multi-arm bandits are my favorite learning problem, more favorite than supervised learning because they have the core of the learning problem. You're not being told the answer, you have to figure it out, all right? So you're trying to figure out what's the highest reward that I can get out of a number of different choices. So I get rewards by picking them. There's a well-known, beautiful algorithm that doesn't just return the mean reward I've seen so far, but returns a confidence bound on the reward. And I pick the arm that has the highest confidence bound. So that both makes me pick good arms, but it also picks me arms that haven't been explored very much yet. And so it has two ideas embodied in one. So as I move around and pick the arm with the upper confidence bound, I, uh, I have an effective algorithm that has logarithmic regret and so on and so forth. So that's the learning side. On the market side, you all probably know about matching markets. On one side, you have buyers. On the other side, you have sellers. On each side, you have a known preference ordering over the other side of the market. You know, so Gale Shapley algorithm is able to find a best matching in this situation. So this is like interns and hospitals and, you know, and so on and so forth. Beautiful part of microeconomics, you know, Nobel Prizes. But you've got to assume you know the preferences a priori to do all that stuff. What if we don't know the preferences? What if we have to explore to find the preferences? All right. So um, how do we do that? Well, we have to interact with this, with this market. All right. So here's a little picture where I'm uh, the guy up there picking uh, an arm. And then there's a bear who's also playing the game. And what if both of us pick the same arm? Well, only one of us is going to get the reward. Which one of us gets the reward? Well, in our model, the arm has a preference back on us because both sides of the markets have preferences on the other side of the market. We don't know that preference. Maybe the arm doesn't even know it too. The arm has got to explore. Okay. All right. So there's our setup. Can we, can we have an algorithm that'll work in this setting? And can we get regret bounds? And the answer, yes. So we define a bandit uh, market. Uh, which has these agents on one side and arms on the other. We deform a, a natural notion of regret, which is the best regret or the best reward you would have relative to running the Gale Shapley unknown preferences, if you, kn if you knew the preferences. Regret relative to that. We define an algorithm which uses Gale Shapley with upper confidence bounds, okay? As if you knew the preferences, but you use the upper bound of the preferences. And our, here's our, our theorem, and I'm about ready to finish, just uh, let my organizers know. Um, so here's a theorem that says that we can uh, get a regret bound in this microeconomic version of a bandit problem. That the regret relative to the, the Oracle Gale Shapley is logarithmic in N, that's great, but it also has a term in the denominator which has, uh, depends on the presence of other agents in the problem. So if Joel is really liking ARM2, and I'm liking ARM2, all right, and I notice that every time Joel picks it, I don't get it. The arm seems to prefer Joel. Then I say, oh, damn it. I'd love to get arm too, but I'm not going to be getting it. So I need to back off and explore the other arms that would, more than I otherwise would have. So I pain a regret there, but I need to do it. But it's just real life. And so I'm capturing that regret with that delta term there, which we have in our paper. Um, okay, I hope that intrigued you a little bit. I think there's lots to do here with all the dynamics coming together with all the game theory. Um, let me just say this entire talk was about dis really about deterministic dynamical systems. I made that choice just to keep it easy, but in parallel, we've been doing a, almost all the same kind of work with stochastic processes. Uh, in particular, Langevin diffusions are gradient-based diffusions, and so things you could do with gradient-based dynamical systems, you can often do with Langevin with more challenges. Um, and here's a raft of papers from my group, which you'll find on my publication page. Uh, doing a lot of the same things I talked about today in the setting of Lodge and Diffusions. Okay, that is my talk. Um, 
uh, I am done. So um, let me just return back to the overall high level here. Um, uh, I think of the current era of machine learning uh, as highly focused on pattern recognition. It's become a commodity. Uh, I think it's great. It's really opened up lots of opportunities, um, lots of new applications. But I think about it a bit like in the early days of chemical engineering, where people were probably building factories and they had no idea really what they were doing, hoping it would work. And there was lots of explosions and lots of people died. And uh, little by little, things kind of got worked out. And I kind of think we're doing that in the real world. We're building lots of systems which are not really working very well for human society at large, and we're groping around. So minimally, we've got to start to bring in to be more mature scientists and engineers, the decision-making side. We've got to be serious about error bars. We've got to be serious about competition. We've got to be serious about scarcity, about allocations, about explanations, and so on and so forth. These are all not just thresholds of neural nets. These are all their own mathematical problems and mathematical theory. At least as far as I'm concerned, this is the area that I'm going to spend the next 10 or 20 years of my life devoted to. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, Mike. We really appreciate your perspective. Um, for those of you in the audience, we're going to have a short question and answer period. Please enter your questions into the Q&A facility on Zoom. And I'm going to turn it over to Gita, who will moderate this part of the session. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there's already a first question from Mengsen Tsang, and the question is whether there is an intuitive interpretation of the Bregman Lagrangian. Um, yeah, it's a Lagrangian. That's my best interpretation. Uh, take the uh, H function to be quadratic, and you literally get out one half x dot squared. You get out of kinetic energy. All right, so it really has kind of everything that you have. Now, uh, if you really know your physics, you'll know that, uh, you know, Lagrange did his work. And then about 100 years later, people ask, where does that Lagrangian come from? Are there underlying symmetries? Are there underlying principles that led to that Lagrangian? And those eventually emerged. I do not know what those symmetries are here. So I do not have an underlying theory that delivers this Bregman and Hamiltonian or Bregman Lagrangian. And I think that's super interesting to work on. Um, so if you go to the kind of lower bounds a la Nemirovsky, those were um, you know, done in a kind of worst case sense. Here's a worst case problem instance, which delivers a lower bound. And uh, what I would really like is some axioms that deliver lower bounds in general. And those axioms deliver, deliver symmetries to deliver things like this Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. That's for the future. I don't know how to do it. Find it super, super interesting. Um, but other than that, really, it's just a thing which is trying to capture a notion of optimal way to optimize and we kind of backwards engineered it from all the known accelerated algorithms, including mirror descent accelerated and so on. We just found the thing which, like in Lyapunov theory, you find a thing which works. And that's what we did. Thank you. So the next question is by Lyndon Young. And the question is, what do you mean by provenance? Oh, thanks for asking that question. Um, yeah, that's a database person's word. And a lot of people in this field, I think, really don't pay enough attention to the database people. They think of them as just providing the pipes that move the data along. Um, but, you know, the database people are the ones who did like ATM machines, um, who created the, you know, the banking system um, that, that could be online and have, you know, billions of transactions per day and all. And one of the big things they came up with is for every piece of data, you have to have an annotation of where that data came from and how and so on, you know, metadata. And you needed that for auditing purposes, but also just kind of keeping the system working kind of purposes. Um, now, in machine learning, we don't tend to think about this very much, but we are going to have to. If you think about the medical system, um, I wrote a little op-ed on AI a couple of years ago, and I had this little example of a, of a medical system problem, which is that a prediction was made in one of my own health situations where uh, it was based on data that turned out to be 10 years out of date, all right? Now, uh, that was not necessarily a problem. Data can be data, but it was a problem because it was done, the data was collected on a different machine than the one that was being used for me. And the change in machine meant that that data was actually giving a huge bias, which gave a wrong prediction, which made us almost have a, 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 a you know operation which could have killed somebody. All right. Now, how would you fix that other than me going back and looking up the study, which is what I did? Well, you would have had provenance. You would have had made a data associated with that old data analysis, which says the reason the geneticist is telling you that there might be a problem here is because of a data analysis from 1995. And you better worry about that because the relevance is not so clear because some things have changed. If we had a system support for part of that as our big data science agenda, 
that every time we have data being used over multiple year spans, not just the data collected today, we got some notion of relevance and provenance accompanying that, then we would start to make better decisions that don't have these possible mismatches between what purpose the data was gathered for, how fresh it is, and so on and so forth. So to me, you know, that's interesting and that that's the kind of contribution a database kind of person can, can make. But most database people don't think about the uncertainty and the, the relevance notion in a machine learning sense. They just think about, uh, you know, classical, um, you know, uh, relevance in a database sense. So it's an open problem and a really important one. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So there's another question uh, about whether there is a potential connection between game theory, related decision making and reinforcement learning decision uh, type schemes. Uh, well, so I, I um, yes, the answer is yes. It's Hamilton Jacoby Brownman theory, right? It, it's just that, you know, mathematical structure links all these things. Um, again, I'm going to bash a little bit the kind of current mi mindset. The current mindset is it's all about neural nets and deep learning. And then if you don't do that, you do reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning is just optimal control theory, folks. It's a particular approach to that. It's it's a Monte Carlo approach to that, all right? And uh, optimal control theory is also limited. It doesn't do any of the competition. It doesn't do the microeconomic thing. It doesn't do the game theory. Um, and um, it also doesn't do the multiple decision-making like we do in statistics and so on and so forth. So it's an okay part to kind of start with some problem thinking about, but it's just very limited too. And really the part of it to me that's particularly interesting is the, is the bandit part, okay? So it's, it's classically viewed that reinforcement learning is just bandit algorithms but with time. And even that's not quite right because in reinforcement learning, you rarely see explicit con concern with exploration. Exploration kind of got left behind when people went to reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. all right? So I think of reinforcement learning, it's great again that everyone's working on and everything, but there's not that many great applications of it so far. A lot of them bring in ad hoc exploration mechanisms and the focus just on one decision making or making decisions over time, that's just optimal control. We got to expand our perspective to have multiple decision makers, to have multiple decisions, to have the stochasticity, uh, you know, and, and, and the game theory. Um, so, you know, again, I, with some apologies for getting up on a soapbox here, but I just think we've been way too limited. You know, it's all neural nets or unsupervised learning or reinforcement. That's everything. No, no, folks, that's just the wrong cut through the space. Thank you. And then maybe. Be, um, due to time, and last question by René Vidal. You explained how one can go arbitrary fast in continuous time, but in discrete time, one is limited to one over k squared due to discretization. Is there an intuitive explanation of how the one over k squared limit arises from an analysis of the discretization? Yeah, there is an intuitive explanation. It has to do with the geometry. And um, uh, the geometry is that when you have very high curvature, you got to slow down. You, you can't you slow down in the sense of the discretization. If you don't discretize more finely there and slow yourself down, uh, you will lose stability. All right, so the paper that does this the best is another paper with Michael Muhlebach. And so I wanna refer again to my, my publications page. Michael Muhlebach uh, joined me from uh, Switzerland, brought a very strong um, control theory and dynamical systems background into our world and has written a couple of beautiful papers, one on lower bounds and continuous time that I alluded to earlier. Uh, the other is called uh, something like momentum methods in dynamical systems or something. Um, and it has a very nice intuitive explanation of exactly how the geometry is affecting the discretization. All right. Well, um, we're grateful for all of the questions and uh, you are taking the time to uh, interact with the audience. Um, I think that's it for today. Our next plenary talk will be next Tuesday, uh, June 16th. Um, we'll hear from Cynthia Dwork at Harvard on her research on privacy. And uh, I'd like everyone to uh, thank Mike one more time, even though we can't hear you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.